trabajo de el, pa, mi país es El Salvador. Eh, yo cuando eh, tuve la oportunidad de venir acá tenía 17 años. Vengo de un país donde se vive mucha violencia, especialmente por las pandillas. Uno de, un muchacho de esos me siguió desde la estación del bus donde yo me bajaba para ya entrar a mi casa. Él dijo que yo tenía que ser para él. Él se quedaba frente a, a la casa. A veces pasaba todo el día ahí parado, esperando tal vez a que yo saliera y por temor no salía de mi casa. Tú no te dejas, pues ellos te secuestran y te violan, te matan. No, no entendía nada, no sabía leyes, nada de eso. Now, that story of uh, the woman identified there as Isabel, obviously you can multiply by a thousand, and they're not all 17 years of age, a lot of them far younger than that, some younger than 10 years of age, all fleeing horrible situations. And more often than not, when they do come, they come to be reunited with a family member that's already stateside. But you have a, this population that is largely in limbo on our table right now, um, are on the front lines of what happens next um, with these families. And what I want to do first is I want to deal with some of the things that you've heard, I've heard when we've done this program, and you tell me, you know, what's fair or what's just, you know, a convenient talking point. But let's start from the macro thing, which somebody says, hey, I feel bad for this girl, but you know what? It's not my problem. We've got enough problems in my community right now. Um, we can't be bringing in all these kids here and have social services, have to absorb them and everything else. We have enough problems of our own in the States. Sorry, Isabel. What do you say to that person? I say it is everyone's problem. This is a humanitarian concern. This is a human being with a life and who deserves to be treated like a human. It's a human rights issue and absolutely deserves treatment under Universal Declaration of Human Rights, to which we're a signatory, and of course she deserves the same treatment. And know that if you do resign to say, go back to where you came from, as we identified before, um, things don't uh, usually work out very well for that person. Patrick, another concern I have uh, heard often is, our school systems already right now, a lot of the public school systems already dealing with painful cuts as a face of budgetary realities and this influx of kids that are ill-equipped for it puts a further strain on a school penalizing the local community that's already there. Is that a fair point? Well, the total numbers coming in are actually relatively small. On Long Island, our public schools educate half a million people a year, so we're talking about less than one half of one percent increase in the number of students. The difficulties come that the students tend to be uh, concentrated in a dozen districts on Long Island. And we think that's where New York State and the federal government need to step up to help take the burden off of taxpayers in those areas that are particularly heavily impacted. Uh, Congressman Steve Israel from Long Island is going to be introducing a bill when Congress returns. And we know Congress hasn't exactly been mm -hmm. quick at acting on legislation. But really, to, to put the federal government in the position of helping out school districts in Westchester, school districts in Jersey, Connecticut, and on Long Island to deal with the influxes that they may see. The total influx on Long Island is actually about maybe 30 people a week in each county, which is very small, but they tend to be going to the same few communities. And so in those communities, it does, it does create a tax issue. Mm. Grace, I've heard um, uh, the other plaint is, hey, um, they come here and uh, the county has to absorb them all. Is that true or are they more often than not being reunited with people that are already here, that are already have roots in this country? Well, yeah, I, I just wanted to, to say that um, they're, most of them or most of the ones that we've seen and I think the, the stories are uh, kids who want to be reunited with a father or, or a mother. You know, and um, they're not coming here to take services. They they are coming here to to be productive, to get educated, to get a life. Um, and and I do think that um, as far as the school districts, the parents are paying property taxes for those schools. So I think you know that that. I think there, there are a lot of more issues that come up, and I agree with Pat that the, the state and the federal government really need to, to sort of step in because um, sometimes there's interrupted education, there's inability to speak English at the beginning, 
But, you know, we see this is not a new issue. It's just that the numbers mm -hmm. are very high. Um, but we've seen kids who come and are now in college and are now studying and being productive. So I, I don't... Um, I don't really see them as, as coming here and saying, you know, I want social services, I want to get food stamps, I want to, you know, in fact, the, the immigration relief that they get allows them to work here. Um, and that's really what, what they want to do. They want to work and they want to study. Patrick, I, at the risk of uh, going down a rabbit hole here, um, in terms of immigration, when and if they ever take it up in Washington, and, and what reform, a comprehensive reform would look like. It's funny, people don't realize this, or maybe not enough do, but the former administration actually had a more expansive um, proposal on the table under the Bush administration than this existing administration does. For it to be productive, so that we don't have to come back to this issue seemingly every election cycle or right after one, what does reform have to really address? So it's not just this emergency humanitarian crisis, but on a broader level about people coming to this country who can and who can't, so that it's more at least manageable and also uh, so there's more transparency. Well, right now we have a system in which people come to the country. Uh, some people come in legally and some keep people come in undocumented. What we need to do as a country is to say, look, it doesn't make sense to have an undocumented population here. Our legal immigration system should not be structured in such a way that family members of U.S. citizens sometimes have to wait 11, 12, 13 years to come in, where a permanent resident trying to bring his wife in has to be separated from her for three years. We need a system where there's no incentive to go through uh, an undocumented process, but where people come in in a regulated way, they're checked out, made sure that they're not a danger to the United States, that they're going to be productive members of our society, and then are given legal status into the United States. That was frankly the way the United States system worked before 1924 when many of our ancestors came to this country. It was really the uh, you know, sort of a focus on racial issues, uh, on the desire to create a white republic that led to us creating a very exclusionary uh, immigration system. And I think we need to go to a system that recognizes the role immigrants play in our society and then allows them to come into this country legally. Finally, I I'm not going to, you know, try and read what, uh, you know, give me your tired, you're hungry, I'm going to go down the, <laughs> that thing, except <laughs> the funny thing is, what even if people go in their own family trees, the first generation that came over are sometimes the most patriotic ones in the family tree um, who buy into the whole concept of not only the American dream and the sacrifice and all the other stuff that gets attached to it. When the kids come here, um, are they coming here, yes, to escape whatever horrible stuff lies behind, but also uh, because they really not only want to buy into, but be a part of what's here? Absolutely. They want to get an education. They want to be safe. They want to rejoin their families. A lot of the families are here and have been here for years. Mom and dad had to leave them behind, came over here, were granted things like temporary protected status under certain laws which provided for protection during earthquakes or hurricanes or certain disasters. The child was left behind. The child now wants to rejoin their family who has since integrated into the community, has a work permit, has a green card. The child just wants to come and be with their family. And this, there needs to be a way for the child to do that legally. Um, I'll let you have the final word on this one, Susan. The, um, <laughs> I'm Grace, I'm sorry. Oh. The, the, um, there we saw some ugly pictures um, about uh, when uh, this story became a national one and the people saying, not in my backyard, and they were screaming at the kids in the buses and all the rest. Have you guys seen firsthand, um, and I know it's a community that you guys, uh, advocates, uh, wherever you are in the metropolitan area, have spoken to each other and beyond that, I'm sure, that when the communities actually see the kids um, and the families and everything else, that there's less of a, a fear maybe with each passing week or month, or is that um, anger uh, still very real and very there? Well, I. I find that people are scared of what they don't know, and once they get to know, um, 
a mother, a child, uh, a family, that, and, and that they see that they're productive members of their community uh, and that the economy might depend on them for certain things. Um, I think people be begin to open up. I think it's an education process. And I, I also want to say that, you know, I, I'm a mother. I have three kids. I couldn't bear to be separated from my children or not have the opportunity to raise them and having to go somewhere else in order to feed them. Um, so I think people make enormous sacrifices. And I can't, um, you know, I can't blame any mother for wanting to be reunited with a kid, and I can't blame a kid for wanting to be with their mother and their father. Yep. Uh, and I think that's just humanity. Well, we're going to see how this all uh, plays out here. Uh, but I want to thank all three of you for um, sharing uh, not only your stories, but also your time with us. Thank you very much. RFL will wrap things up right after this.